but there was something worryingly familiar about the wheel marks on the track. But the significant thing is, the two rear wheels plow through this central part here, dissipate a tremendous amount of energy, one of them fails, and when the car lands, it lands on one of the rear wheels. From this point onwards, it's actually effectively a three-wheeled car. Just as we hit uh, peak speed, there was a bit of a bump, which I wasn't expecting because the desert's very smooth there, and I got uh, three of the structural captions on. The, and what had actually happened is we had broken a uh, bracket at the back, and the, the, the back end had actually gone down and, uh, and bumped uh, hard up against effectively a bump stop. And the, the shock had actually then been transmitted to the tailplane and the structure as a jolt. And the computers had picked that up and said, you've had a jolt here, you need to check it. So the car rolled to a stop. I was extremely disappointed, I, you can almost say devastated, because um, you know, it's my responsibility after all. Yes, we've got to look back at the structure, yes, I've got to look at some of the means of attaching things um, to make sure it's adequately strong for next time, bearing in mind that Black Rock, by experience, is a much kinder desert than this one. Um, Performance-wise, that car's got it all. With the car's suspension badly damaged, the team were forced to pack up and return to Britain. Thrust had not let them down, and for some, the car had taken on a personality of its own. I feel it's part of me or I'm part of it, really. Um, I think it's, 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 it's very hard to describe. Um, I don't like to be away from it. I like to you know, go and see it, just touch it. And when you see it running right on the desert and just unleashed, it looks absolutely stunning. And that, that really makes it worthwhile. It's like having a baby with a broken leg. <laughs> it's, it's not a machine, it's a thing. It's, well, it's part of all of us, I think. But she's going to be mended and we're taking her out to Nevada and we're going to do it. Black Rock Desert, Nevada. And the team had finally made it, a year behind schedule. They had spent more than 100,000 man-hours on the car. This was where they were always destined to be. Thrust was about to produce the greatest performance of her life. On September the 25th, 1997, Andy Green unleashed the 10-ton car. On her first run, consuming fuel at the rate of four gallons a second, thrust achieved 700 miles per hour. Turning the car round within the hour, Andy Green fired the afterburners and propelled thrust into the record books with a speed of 728 miles per hour. The timekeepers averaged the two runs and the official figure was proudly acclaimed. A new land speed record of 714 miles per hour. Richard Noble's team had done it. That is just fantastic. It's a really good record. Uh, in a word, magic. It just brought that back those memories of 14 and 15 years ago when Thrust 2 was doing the same thing down the same desert. Lovely. After the euphoria of the new land speed record, Thrust was overhauled and checked out. This was no time for the team to rest on their laurels. They were going for the ultimate record, the sound barrier. But time and money were running out. Noble had to face the challenge that he was best suited for, juggling the diminishing funds against the cost of the venture. Thrust is not in trouble at the moment, but basically it's getting, getting pretty borderline, it's getting pretty close. 
We've probably got enough money to keep on running the project for, about, for a further eight days or so. Um, after that, it starts to become seriously difficult um, because um, uh, I know very well that we'll never get out here to do, to do this again. I mean, this is, this is it. This is the last possible shot. On October the 3rd, Thrust was ready to start her runs again. Though edging closer and closer to the elusive sound barrier, each run was dogged with problems. All stations stand by. SSC has stopped. Still not called safe. Minimise. OK, we appear to have overrun by 1.4, 1.5 miles. There was mention of a parachute failure. OK. By October the 13th, and with the problems overcome, Thrust was set to run again. At 2.03 p.m., Andy Green was ready to take her into the history books. Thrust reached a peak speed of 766 miles per hour and had become the first car to go supersonic. Frantically, the team turned Thrust round and at 3.03 p.m., she was into her second run. This time her speed was 761 miles per hour. Are you said timing? Uh, can you confirm that run was within the hour? Over. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot do that. You missed it by about a minute. No, no. Copy, sir. Ready to copy speeds and read back. I read that provisional Mac number one. Well, there you go. That's record breaking. Uh, we didn't do it, did we? Thrust's failure to complete two runs within an hour meant that she had missed the world record by one minute. Two days later, on the 15th of October, they tried again. At 9.09 a.m., Andy Green took Thrust to a peak speed of 763 miles per hour. The provisional Mach number is 1.015. So you've witnessed a supersonic run there. The clock is going now. We've been five minutes, 26 seconds since the car entered the measured mile. We've got to be back within the minute. Well, sorry, within the hour. Let's get that right. <laughs> With five minutes to spare, Thrust made her return run. Her peak speed was 771 miles per hour. This time, there could be no doubt. Thrust had done it with an official time of Mach 1.02. The Thrust team had devoted nearly four years of their lives to her, and she had repaid them by becoming the fastest car on Earth.